Hey, what's up everyone? I hope you're doing well. I wanted to thank everybody for checking out the last video that I put out, which was the Tethys Rig Rundown. I'll leave a link in the description below if you haven't seen it, so that way you can go check it out. This video will be a continuation of that, and I wanted to jump into Logic so that way I could show you guys our session, so I could show you the clicks, cues, patch changes, things like that. I'm also going to open up our XR app so that way you can see kind of the routing and where instruments are coming in. I'll only really be able to show you a few things, but at the very least you'll be able to see what our mixes look like and the routing of that kind of stuff. I won't go too in-depth, but I have a little mock-up so that way you can hear the music, you can see the patch changes with the axe effects and the session, you can hear the clicks and cues, and then you'll also be able to hear what I hear in my ears. So let's get into it. Okay, so here we are in Logic. This is one of the sessions that I created for Tethys. It's one of a handful, so let's get into it and I'll go over everything from top to bottom. We have time signatures, we have tempos, we have clicks, we have cues, sample tracks, uh, my axe effects, the patch changes for them, patch changes for Quinn's axe effects, and then the few patch changes for Seb's bass. Uh, starting at the top, this whole line right here, this whole time signature line, is where we put any of the time signature changes that we have within our songs. Below that is our tempo map. We're able to go in here and actually set the tempo for each of the sections of the songs. And this is kind of important once you get to like making your clicks and stuff like that. Because if you don't set your tempos um, correctly, the, the spacing is going to be different and the click won't actually land where it needs to. So it's very important to make sure that your tempos uh, match up with your clicks. So as you can see, we change tempos quite a bit. Um, we go from, you know, anywhere from 145, 170, you know, 135 down to 90. So basically this whole area is where we input all of our tempo changes. Below that, we have our click tracks. We have one of these for every song that, that we play live. It helps keep all of us in time. The nice thing about having our in-ear set up the way that we do is that if you don't want the click, you don't really have to have it. You can have all the other instruments in your ears and just go from there. Most of us have the clicks in our ears just because it's uh, it, it keeps us all in track. If any one of us falls off, uh, it's an easy way for, for them to get back on um, and for the rest of us to kind of stay locked in and stay where we're at. So below that, we have cues. This gives us cues as to what sections we're on and when they're about to start. So as you can see here, it says intro, one, two, three, four, and then on the one right after that, we know to start playing. We have a click that kind of gets the tempo set up beforehand as well. As you can see, we don't just have them at the intros of songs, we have them throughout the songs, throughout all of the songs. So we have cues for verse sections, we have cues for, oh, <laughs> this one's this one's not actually a section, it's just to make sure that a certain part gets played, so it's just a count in for that part. Um, that's why it doesn't have like an actual section uh, name. Arguably, some of the most important cues is like the solo section so that we know that we're coming in on time. Again, starting on starting on that one of the next bar. So moving on from there, below that we have sample tracks. Tethys does incorporate a lot of samples, a lot of synths or like little orchestral pieces uh, within their within our music. Obviously, it, it's not feasible for us to, to have that stuff live. Uh, so we have samples of it. So that's what this whole line here is. It's also a good way to have uh, what's the way to put it? No dead air during your show. You can have a seamless show from start to finish without any kind of dead air just by simply incorporating samples in between songs or intros for songs or outro samples and things like that just so that way you don't have dead air in between your songs and that's kind of the way we like to run our set. We have an intro sample here that isn't really part of this song, Progenitor. Since we put it at the beginning of the set, we wanted to have something so that way you could actually, something to like set the mood. So we, you know, picked a note, picked a sound, made a sample for that, slapped it at the beginning, and that's kind of the intro of this set. We have other samples throughout other songs. These are gonna be choir samples for uh, one of our most recent releases, Darkest Reflection. So these are uh, choir samples that we have in the back of the chorus um, that we put in the song when we actually recorded it. So we've taken those samples out and then implemented them here in the session so that way we can still have those samples in a live situation. Um, we also have some pizzicato violin that comes in during the bridge slash solo section and that's what we have here. The rest of the song we pretty much have synthesizers and stuff like that kind of following some of the riffs just to kind of bolster them up and make them a little bit bigger. Um, so that's what the rest of these ones are here. It's pretty much what that's for, what that whole sample channel's for. Again, good way to have those parts of your song that you can't perform live or that you can't uh, have a choir or an orchestra or a synthesizer on stage for. 
it's a good way to incorporate that into your session and have it in a live situation. Below that, you can see that we have patch changes. So this is my Axe FX and all of the patch changes that I have throughout this particular set of songs. As the playhead crosses over these, it sends a MIDI signal to a MIDI interface, which then sends it to the Axe FX, and then it changes our patch for us so that way we don't have to have any kind of pedal boards on stage. It allows us to run around stage and not have to worry about the patch changes. As long as our rig is solid, being able to have the rig trigger the patch changes is huge for us. Super beneficial, allows us to move all over the stage. Later on here in a bit, I'll go over a section of one of the songs. I will have like a picture in picture so you can see the axe effects change as the playhead goes over the patch changes. We generally have patch changes at the beginning of the songs. So there's one here, one here, and that's just to kind of reset the patch back to whatever we need to start that song off of. If that start song needs to start with a rhythm patch, it changes us back right to the rhythm patch, or if it needs to be a lead patch, we'll, we'll have it change to a lead patch. But most of the time we have patch changes for clean sections, for solo sections, for any kind of lead section that uh, requires a less tight patch, anything different from our rhythm patch, and then essentially a patch change to change back to the rhythm patch. And then below that you can see Quinn's patch changes, and below that you can see uh, Seb's patch changes. So Seb doesn't have very many of them, we recently got an Axe FX which sparked uh, the last video and doing the uh, the rewiring for the racks for that. So he's just started experimenting with patch changes and having clean bass and dirty bass. One of his solos and one of our recent releases has that patch change in it. So that's what these patch changes here that you can see these yellow patch changes that are just above, above my screenshot there. And that's pretty much the session. I guess what we can do is we can hop into where my guitar is coming in to the X-Air Edit application. So here we are in the X-Air Edit app. This is what we use to control the Behringer XR18 mixer that we use to mix our in-ears with. So as you can see, we have 18 channels that we can have going to our in-ears in any configuration at any time, however we want it. We take kick, snare, hat, tom one, two, three, four, bass, my guitar, Quinn's guitar. I have a, a vocal mic in here. It's really more for talkbacks during practices or if we have enough space on stage, we'll set up a mic stage left and stage right so that way if Quinn's on either side of the stage, he can have a mic to get to since he does more singing and more backup vocals. Uh, Stevie has a vocal. Quinn obviously has his main vocal. We have a front of house talkback so that way we can take an XLR from front of house, plug it in, and then we can hear them in our in-ears. Beyond that, we have the clicks, we have the cues, and then we have our tracks, we have left and right. So we've went over the tracks that we're taking in. This kick, snare, drums, and box reverb is effects. Um, the XR18 doesn't actually allow you to send single channels. Let me rephrase that. It allows you to send single channels to the effect, but it doesn't allow you to affect multiple channels with the effect, which is kind of a bummer. But we really don't use this, it's there if we want it, but we really don't use effects. Let's see, we can go into our actual mixes. So since the XR18 only has six uh, bus outputs, it doesn't actually allow us to have stereo inputs, or sorry, stereo outputs for our ears for everybody. So what we've done to kind of get around that and get stereo mixes to the people that really need it and mono mixes to the people that uh, can get by with mono mixes is what we've done is we use the main left and right we use that for Shay, our drummer. So this is Shay's mix. So as you can see, he can adjust this completely separately however he wants. And since it's the main left and right, he has a stereo mix and he can also pan anything the way he wants to. Below that is bus one and two, which is my mix. So this is uh, my left and right mix. As you can see, my mix is very different than Shay's mixes. Below that is Quinn's mix. Quinn's mix is obviously very different. Most of our mixes are pretty different, but we all need different things. Um, my guitar is normally louder in my mix. My guitar is much louder because I want to be able to hear myself a little bit more. Another way to differentiate that is the way things are panned. So if you follow this up here, you can see that I have it panned hard right and then I have Quinn's guitar panned hard left. So that's another thing that allows us to separate ourselves from each other and differentiate whose who's guitar parts are heard. So I know to listen to my right ear for my guitar parts, I know that Quinn's in my left ear. Uh, and then everything else is up the center. So that was Quinn's mix and then below that we have a mono mix here. Now this is Sev's mix. Again, since we don't have enough outputs, both bass and vocals take mono mixes while the rest of us take stereo mixes. This is what Sev has going in his ears. He has a mono mix and this is the mix that he chooses to have. Next to that is Stevie's mix, our vocalist. So the nice thing about having 
the stereo ears, at least most of us, is that we can split guitar parts, you know, we can split the drums up and, like, be able to differentiate where things are and know to listen to one ear or the other. Um, as for the other guys, they have a mono mix, so they need to prioritize kind of what they need to hear over everything else. Um, it, since it's a little bit harder for them to differentiate and make that and have a stereo image and make that a little bit wider so that way you can place things within that stereo image. But again, this is the app that we use to control the XR18 mixer. This is what we use to, you can do it wirelessly. We really don't. We kind of set our in ears at practice and then tweak during sound checks when we get to, to the venues and stuff like that and then go from there. Uh, most of the time, we don't really need to change them a whole lot. What we notice most of the time is that bass is a big thing once we get into a live room, once we get into a, a venue or anything like that. There's a lot more bleed into certain microphones from the PA and from the, the bass and uh, wedges, if there's wedges on stage or anything like that. Being able to edit your mix and make it the way you want is super valuable. From here, I'll show you a tiny bit of routing. I'll show you where my guitar's coming in. I'll play or a section of the song so that way you can hear my in-ear mix. You, you should be able to hear my guitar on one side. It'll just be a track for the rest of, uh, of, of everything else since obviously I don't have uh, the drums here at my place or the rest of the band here to play those sections. So let's hop into that and then I think we'll be done. wanted to show you guys quickly the routing of the guitar. So you can see that my guitar is coming in on channel 9. It's coming through my right earphone or headphone and that's just so that way we can get more separation in our ears and actually be able to uh, differentiate, differentiate all the different instruments. Um, again, my guitar is coming in on channel 9. I wanted to show you this within uh, within Logic, within our session, so that way you can get kind of an idea of what we hear uh, when it comes to our in-ears. So normally we don't have the actual track in here like this. This uh, layer or this, uh, this audio region isn't even in here. So I put this in here for this example specifically. We'll play to this real quick and then again my guitar should be coming in on the right side. It may be different, I won't know until I listen to this back, but it should be coming in on the right side and that'll give you an idea of what it sounds like in my ears when we're actually playing. So let's give this a go. I messed it up a little bit there, but you get the idea. You can hear that my guitar's coming in on one side, clicks and cues are all straight up. Normally, with the drums and the rest of the instruments in there, the kick, the snare, the bass are all straight up. So they're coming in both sides of the ears. And then Quinn I have on my left side. So again, to kind of widen the stereo field and be able to differentiate. And I know that I listen to my right ear for my guitar. But that's pretty much how we run our in-ears and our clicks and cues. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification. It really helps out the channel and it helps with the YouTube algorithm. If you're curious about any of the gear that I use, albeit filmmaking gear, streaming gear, or musical gear, I'll have a link down in the description below that will take you to my kit page where you can see some of that stuff. Thanks again. I really appreciate you watching and we'll see you in the next one.